so, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. Okay, hey, so I've given this talk before about a month ago, and uh, I'll just quickly go through the slides because this is a different audience. This is, you guys are much more hardware focused, so I'll try to emphasize that part. And the hot topic that I wanted to, that sort of drove a lot of the issues in this is, is Intel versus in, uh, ARM, <laughs> right? Um, at least I, I think it's a hot topic in more ways than one. Um, something that came out quite recently is the performance per watt of these enterprise server grade ARM processors. Uh, the numbers there are something like two to one, like an Intel CPU system takes like 300 watts versus some ARM uh, processor taking about half that. And um, similar demos, like the, the, the numbers always vary, but it's always like vastly in favor of the ARM-based server systems. And in fact, this person here is a CEO of a company called Cloudflare, which is a, another CDN that hosts 10% like of the internet, uh, is their claim. Uh, anyway, they were like, like really looking into this to replace their, you know, whatever thousands of servers that they have with something more efficient. And so I was thinking, that sort of sounds really familiar. In fact, about 20 years ago, this thing came out, right? And some of you at the University High School probably weren't even out, but this thing came out. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so one of the key things about Google when it launched was actually I mean, not just the page rank algorithm and all this, you know, index the whole web and all that, because there was alternatives out there. But one of the crazy things that I thought was uh, revolutionary and that stuck around, because like, page rank's gone, but like, what stuck around was the idea that you can host web stuff, web giant services on commodity hardware. At the time, it was these machines. And in fact, most of these were donated to them. So like they were using, back then, Intel Pentium 2, which was sort of what you'd had in your desktop consumer grade you know, uh, server, uh, de like a desktop machine, and they were using it for servers. Uh, this is in fact donated to them because they were like poor starving students at this university. Uh, IBM tried to donate them a bunch of like, you know, what was then like enterprise grade, very expensive stuff, but it was too late because the idea was already out there that you can run, you know, Systems that are designed for you know all the problems that come with commodity hardware that, that it's failing, it, it fails all the time, and sort of the the big idea is you, you focus on not just like the most powerful servers, the most powerful uh, processors, but you go for something that's the best performance per cost. So if I so I, I was thinking about this, and in the, today's context, I sort of feel that the you know this whole Intel versus ARM and sort of replacing that what was then Intel versus sort of Intel was the underdog versus like the, the enterprise systems of that day. And I feel like today, you know, maybe Intel has sort of become that now enterprise class uh, hardware. So they're like, you know, the best CPUs out there. You can get these Intel Xeons, thousands of dollars, really powerful. ARM is sort of the new commodity because of everyone has it in their phone. I mean, everyone, or your Raspberry Pis, or all these things come out of that ARM commoditized market. In fact, I feel the best performance per dollar today is coming from phones, like, except for the latest generation phones. <laughs> So if you look at the phones that came out like one or two or three years ago, the, the CPUs are basically trash. Like you, nobody's going to put them in a phone or a tablet or anything today. So you can pick them up for scraps. And because there were so many of them made, because we all have phones, like there's billions and billions of phones. Even if there's a, a few percent leftover capacity, there's going to be you know shops on. You can go to Ali, 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 AliExpress or Alibaba.com and buy them by the thousands, and they're super cheap. So they don't really expire, as far as I know. You guys maybe felt no better, but silicon chips don't really degrade if you keep them in a sealed container on a shelf in China. It's kind of fine. <laughs> so if, uh, is anyone here at the FOSS Asia conference, by the way? If you, if, you know, I had a really great time there, and one of the most impactful talks um, to me was uh, Bunny Huang's talk, where he sort of gave an overview of the uh, Shenzhen landscape. Like all the hardware manufacturing happens there, and like you know, it was really insightful views. One of the key things that, to me, um, that really struck me that was, was the concept that some of these individual stalls in, in these electronics malls in, uh, in Shenzhen could have more inventory, more chips in their shop than like you find in all of North America on these online online sites. If you just like do the numbers, add it up, and you go like, okay. Then look at the website, and you know, they have like 20, like, they have like 200 available, and then the shop would have like you know, thousands and thousands. Um, so I thought that was really cool. Like they, they have this surplus stock that's sort of left over in China. Nobody does anything with it, so it's just collecting dust, sort of, I guess. Yeah. And some other stuff is like if you look at the number of 
CPUs being sold today, if you look at like servers, desktops, and mobile, you see some interesting things, especially when you look at the absolute numbers. Like, you know, we all know like mobile phones is like growing up like crazy, but it's sort of flattening off because there's only so many people in the world and they all have phones now. Um, desktops, obviously, you know, we expect that it's kind of dropping. Uh, servers kind of slowly still going up a little bit, not overwhelming. Um, in absolute numbers, though, it's a different, like it's a different story. Like uh, it's just this is millions of units, by the way. It's like 11 million CPUs every year. Like Intel Xeon's desktops, 100, laptops, 160, tablets, something like that. But phone is just kind of ridiculous. Um, in fact, if you look at the number of phones that all have these ARM CPUs, it's 100 plus times the number of servers. So what is this ARM thing? Let's look, look at a little bit about it. Uh, stands originally for Acorn, RISC, machines. RISC meaning something else, but then they eventually changed that, and now it's just ARM, OK? So this is like almost all mobile processors uh, ever, like not just in phones, but you know, like there's 100 billion of these things sold. And if you look at those other numbers, that's a lot. Right, and that's all ARM CPUs. They're everywhere. Like we all have multiple of them. You know, like, even in our laptops, there'll be some ARM processors doing some random thing, like controlling your touchpad or whatever. Right. Um, so the ARM ecosystem exists consists not of just one company like like Intel, which would just be Intel selling them, or AMD. But actually, a lot of companies license um, their chips from from ARM, and they license two things primarily, which is the instruction set. Like for instance, ARM8 or ARM7 or ARM6 before that, um, but also entire designs of the CPU cores. So when you're just assembling a CPU, CPU, you can either say, okay, I want this instruction set, and I'll go and design my own circuitry and everything, or I can, or, or you can go and just say, I want a license for this core design, and just how many do you need, and how powerful do you need to be, or how much performance do you have, and how much can it cost, and you can figure it out with them, and then they help you build all that stuff. So there's a lot of companies doing that. Um, one of the cool things to me uh, as a web developer. Uh, is that the newer ARM CPUs aren't really that risk anymore, where it stood for reduced or something like that, like where it was very simple CPUs, uh, and therefore cheap. Now, nowadays, actually, you know, people are paying good money for phones and stuff like that, so the cost of them actually has gone up as well, um, or, and definitely the performance of them has gone up. So now they've got uh, like hardware accelerated cryptography, which means that when you're doing something like what I'm doing with the web, it's all HTTP2. It's, it's by default all going to be encrypted. And so when they can do that in, in silicon, it's going to be much more efficient. Um, there exist also some of these server CPUs. Actually, so I, I made these slides up maybe a month ago. Uh, one of these companies has now sort of pulled the plug on, this, on their project. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the whole Qualcomm story that happened like an, uh, a, a little while ago where there was like a big takeover attempt by some other company. And I think one of the things is that they kind of like cut back on their research spending for a little while. I don't know, I'm just hypothesizing, but there's still the other one. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sure lots of people, will, lots, lots of companies have shown interest in this idea that you can run you know, ARM servers. Um, so I'm sure that will continue to evolve that landscape. Uh, anyway, back to what I'm doing with them is uh, sort of <laughs> looking at like Netflix and. That was not part of my slides, just for YouTube. Anyway, so, so I'm a web developer and I host websites, I make single page apps and things like that, and I want them to be fast for everyone in the world. So when I look at traditional uh, CDNs, like a company like Netflix, which we're all familiar with, and I'm not trying to say anything about Netflix per, uh, per se, it's just a good reference that everyone can, can relate to as a CDN. Um, they serve huge amounts of traffic, like a third of all traffic in the United States at peak times is what they've been claiming for years. So it's mind blowing. So I've created something now that I like to call Commons Host. Um, this is a project that I've been working on for about a couple of years. Uh, like started off as a little side project, experiments and stuff like that, and has sort of consumed my life now. Um, it's uh, world's smallest CDN right now, sadly. I guess uh, I'm using really, really small little servers, VPSs. Uh, it's all built on Node.js, which is another thing that kind of makes people scratch their head, because why would you ever do something that's supposed to be about performance with Node.js, which is not, like, I think it's pretty good, but like some people are like, oh, you have to write assembly code or like etch your instructions in silicon or something, I don't know. Uh, I also designed everything to be HTTP2 by default. That, that was actually what got me into it first place. A couple of years ago, I was like really into like speedy and 
the SPD wipe protocol thing and I became HTTP2. So I've been really, really passionate about that. And it's all open source. Every single line of code that I write is open source. Um, except for my uh, sort of security tokens and environment variables and things like that, obviously. Um, and what, what I'm trying to actually do is build a ridiculously huge number of pops, like a point of presence for a CDN is critical to have low latency to everyone in the world. You want to get as close to as many people in the world as possible. Uh, and I think all the aforementioned you know, stuff is critical to achieving that. So, okay, I've, this is the hardware component of the talk. I did not build this, but kind of did. Okay, so, thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, Show it closer to the camera. Oh, here you go, here you go. I mean, it's the slide's right there. You can just make the slide full screen, just saying. Um, so anyway, this is actually a little ARM-based server, uh, which a lot of you probably know. It's made by a company called uh, Heart Kernel in Korea. It's called Odroid. In fact, this is an Odroid HC1. That's why I say I don't make these things. It's just open hardware that I'm using for my open source CDN. Uh, the only thing but pretty much that I did to it was to spray paint the cover white, because I think it looks pretty. And I put a little sticker on there. That's, that's, that's really pretty much it. It's inside is it's just an uh, extruded aluminum case with a little uh, board. This is the entire board. There's nothing behind. This is the SSD hard drive. And this little board has, at the bottom has a little uh, like Exynos, Samsung Exynos chip from a phone from like the Samsung Galaxy S4 or 5 or whatever it was. Uh, it's got eight CPU cores, a couple of gigabytes of RAM, and a gigabit Ethernet port. And like I said, I, I just paired it with an SSD. You could take any 2.5 inch SSD. There's a 2.5 inch model as well that's a little bit thicker. It costs about a dollar more or something. I mean, I, I pick them up for like 49 USD or something, right? It's really, really affordable. And uh, what I do is I load Node.js on there. Because my code is written in, in JavaScript, it actually runs just fine because Node.js is, is supported by, by uh, ARM. So I, I'm just running Ubuntu on there, and I have my Node.js code on there, and it just runs quite well. And in fact, in the last couple of years, a lot of optimization has gone into making, uh, the, the, you know, making stuff work better on ARM, like server stuff traditionally. So what the bigger players are doing in terms of optimizing for their server-grade ARM is sort of really benefiting everyone else who's running on like, you know, Raspberry Pis and, and equivalent systems. So that's, that's the little uh, hardware thing. Um, in terms of specs, like uh, a traditional CDN server or a traditional you know, big server in a data center would just be like an eight core Xeon processor or, 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 or above. Uh, this is like an eight core ARM processor, which is like you know, the big little thing. So it's like four really low power cores for when you're running on 10% on on of your battery remaining and it's trying to save your, ba save your battery life. Right? So it has four little cores in there, four bigger cores, but when you say big core, they're really, really low performance still. But I managed to like, benchmark it and actually saturate like a one gigabit connection. So um, like, that, that achieves my goal. Like, anything more than that is wasted. So I was happy with that. Um, it uses very little power compared to a traditional server as well. This comes with a, a five volts, four amp power supply. So it's like, and then when you're even on, under full load, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just like not even attaching like a, uh, any external devices to it, it's just taking maybe like five watts, 10 watts max. You know, you could run a Bitcoin miner on it and not hit like 10 watts probably. Um, so it's actually, it's actually like 20 watts is, is very generous. Um, in terms of storage, yeah, like a, you, can, you can, if you put like a, like a 3.5 inch model drive in there, you can get like 10 terabytes plus. So it's pretty decent capacity performance wise. Any hard drive today, especially SSD, will saturate a gigabit connection. So like I see no real issues with that. Oh, and yeah, you can stack them. I had like five of them at home. I should have included that photo. It's quite, it's quite cool to see. And then you have like all these different Ethernet cables in there because you're limited to one gigabit each, right? Because uh, it's sort of commodity networking hardware. Uh, anyway. Okay, so you could stack a whole bunch of them. People have done this to do I don't know what. Um, but I don't think the point of like building CDN servers is to have like really gigantic servers. I think it's better to um, just go for a lot of servers. When you have like a different hardware cost structure, instead of deploying one big server in a big data center with a 100 gigabit or whatever connection to it, I want to deploy like 100 of these with one gigabit each across the world or across a city or a country. Um, so the cost of these is like orders of magnitude less, so I can have orders of magnitude more of them, so I can actually hopefully deploy them closer to more people in the world. That's sort of really my goal. Um, I look at the number of pops of existing CDNs, it goes from a couple of dozen to, you know, the biggest one is less than 2,000, which is, sounds like a lot, but like, that's because they're big servers and more or less in data centers. Some of these might be like in a closet in a university campus where they have like a big user base, but like a lot of them are just going to be in data centers, like professional stuff, 
And I'm like totally not designing for that because I feel like that's already a solved problem. Like these guys have done a fantastic job. Again, I don't mean to like hate on anyone. Um, it's just that that's not where I can contribute my, you know, my, my value. Uh, I'd like to deploy these, and so far I have done that now. In the last month or so, I've deployed them in places like, uh, uh, like, like in, in Malaysia. You deploy something there without like knocking on the door of a data center and paying thousands of dollars a month. I just go to my friend's house and say, you have fiber. Okay, can you plug one of these things in? And done. We have a pop for the CDN. And we remotely administer it and deploy it and manage it and secure it. And it works. Um, so yeah, that's that story in a nutshell. Essentially, there's a lot of places in the world where they could use something like this, I feel. And uh, you can't just put like you know a billion dollars into building a million big or a thousand big servers. I mean, I mean for the same for the money of like you know one or two of those servers, you could have a thousand of these pops. And that's sort of been my goal. Uh, okay, so in fact, I started off with this sort of realization that if what if data centers were kind of like HDBs? <laughs> Or you know the idea of like like we live in Asia we live in like most of the world today is like new new housing is coming up as big apartments and they all have fiber and it turns out that's not just true in Singapore it's actually true uh, across Asia like that was that was something that I just kind of was really fascinated by in the last six months that I found out um, fiber is so cheap to install that all the new business parks and combos and and, and, and you know new new developments across Asia when, and we're talking China India Southeast Asia. Um, uh, Middle East, uh, Far, Far East, uh, Central Asia, uh, and in fact now places in Africa too that, that I've been talking to friends there, uh, like they all just have fiber ISPs. Like you look at a country like Myanmar, which is like kind of economically only opened up very recently, but there's like half a dozen ISPs that offer fiber, more than Singapore. I'm not saying that they have full coverage, but they're available and they're growing so fast. And, and same thing in the Philippines, which is traditionally known for having like some of the slowest internet in the world. So, random picture, right, same thing. Okay, so, yeah, blah, 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 talked about that. We're out of time, I'm kind of really skipping through, sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, so, if you want to, uh, if this has at all been interesting to you, check out the website, commons.host, uh, check out my Twitter, uh, you know, get in touch with me, uh, but try to just deploy your website to it. I really need people to give me feedback on the usability. I really want to make it super easy for developers like myself who are front-end developers uh, to just deploy static websites. Um, it's kind of if you're using you know something like GitHub Pages or Netlify or one of these sites or S3 Bucket and, and, and you know this is supposed to be the same functionality but slightly easier, slightly more open sourcey, uh, and actually with pops in the places that we probably have our users like Southeast Asia. Like uh, in the coming days, I'll be deploying pops uh, with you know friends in, in, Viet in Vietnam, uh, looking at Indonesia deploying some servers there. So if you have users in those countries, this should be like lightning fast compared to going back to the S3 server in Singapore, you can just have it with someone on your same ISP locally, or within the country at least. Um, if you like the idea uh, of how this could be kind of cool, uh, let me know if you can host one of these, not if you're in Singapore, because I already have several of them here, but if you have friends in like, other countries that could benefit from something like this, because they don't have like a local copy of AWS data center, then get in touch. Um, or if you want to sponsor one of these things, uh, they're very cheap, a couple hundred bucks for like the entire setup with the hard drive and everything. Um, let me know, um, and otherwise just like tell your friends about this project if you like it. Thank you.